Dr. Dale Truding, my partner here, and I, as, law, and as well as these panelists, are going to share some experiences with you about college admissions. The college admissions officers are going to share what they look for in uh, the freshman class that they have been inviting in and what kinds of things make a freshman applicant an attractive applicant to them. And the parents are going to share with you some of the experiences, the joys and the sorrows of this experience, and the anxieties. There are some, plenty of all of those things, the ups and the downs of it all. Um, and our belief is that being informed about this process can help you guide your children to make this a very uh, joyful experience. We certainly hope that will be the case. So uh, let me start by introducing our parent panelists. Dr. Glasgow, Dr. Denise Glasgow is on our board as well as a parent of a student about to be a freshman, a junior now in high school, and uh, she will have some experiences to share. Phil Crucius also on our board who has had a recent um, entrant into the University of Illinois. Diana Chrysis, board member and parent who has one child uh, already in college and one in high school about to head that in that direction. And Mike Brown, who's director of facilities in our district as a parent, has a child at college and one on the way. So we appreciate the panelists of parents. And now I'd like to ask uh, Dale if she will introduce the panel from the colleges. Well, I am honored that we've had five representatives from five different universities um, choose to share their time with us. And I'd like to begin by introducing Lamitra Curry from Northern Illinois, who had a two and a half hour drive just to get here this morning. Shauna Armstrong from Aurora University, Tamara McLean from Harper College, Megan O'Rourke from Marquette University, and Susan Reese from Loyola University. So they're going to share with you some of the things that they're looking for in their applicants. So I'm going to begin with the first question to our esteemed university representatives. And Lamitra, if you're OK starting this question, and we'll just go down the line. And then with our other questions, please just feel free to jump in when you have something you'd like to share. The world has changed dramatically in the past five to 10 years. How have these changes influenced the characteristics you are looking for in your undergraduate applicants? And I know some of you also work with graduate applicants, and I know our audience would be very happy to hear about that as well. Let me try. Okay, the characteristics that we're looking for in our students is one for them to know how to be a self-starter. We accept that we are in a, a whirlwind of technology with Twitter and Facebook, and sometimes parents might get upset because the, the students are constantly communicating through those avenues. At our university, we've turned the, the table, so to speak, and we have begun to reach our students through those different media um, outlets because that's where they're interested in. And it is through those media outlets that we um, tap into the critical thinking piece. We tap into their world in regards to technology, but we try to alleviate what we call the banking system, where we tell them what we want them to learn. They learn it, they regurgitate it on a test. We want them to critically think about the decisions that they are going to make and um, how they position themselves in the space of being at the university. Thank you, Shauna. To kind of piggyback um, just off the media, you know, we understand that students are being bombarded on all different avenues, but we're also looking for students that are really, truly focused and interested um, in the actual learning process and, and wanting to better themselves and those around them. Uh, you know, we're also looking for students that are goal-oriented, dedicated in, in every possible thing they do, and, and when we give them a task or when they begin something, they go through with that. You know, they see that through from start to finish, so thank you. Tamara? Yeah, well, at Harper, our process is a little different, and we're looking for that well-rounded student, but for, at the community college, 
we find a place for everyone. We want all of our students to feel connected. And because Harper allows an opportunity for students to be self-expressive, we are looking for that self-starter, we're looking for that go-getter, but we're also looking for that student that may not have any idea of where they're gonna go to college. And our goal is to help them find that path. And so Harper is very committed to working with our students, with our faculty, with their advisors to make sure for whatever your direction is, we're going to help find that path for you. We're here to help you financially to figure out if you want to go right away to one of our four counterparts or if you just want to go directly into the career workforce but we're here to help you get started and move forward thank you Megan I don't necessarily think that Marquette has changed in terms of the type of student that we're looking for we're always going to be um, a school that has a holistic application review we want to see good well-rounded students who are strong academically who have a good resume, um, who have written a good essay. <clears throat> but I think in the ways that students have come to find us, as they both have mentioned, as a couple of other panelists have mentioned, obviously social media, the internet, those kinds of things really affect the way that students find us. Mm -hmm. And I think for us and, and the way that we go about you know, talking with students about Marquette, the, the whole piece of understanding that, you know, when my parents went through the college search process, if they wanted information about a school, they wrote a letter, <laughs> stamped it, put it in the mail, and sent it off to get more information. Mm -hmm. Now, a student can hop on um, Marquette's website, they can get on Facebook and look at the Marquette page, they can follow us on Twitter, we have a YouTube channel, and I think all of these pieces have forced us to provide that same sense of what what we provide a student in terms of education on a much broader level. Thank you. Susan? Good morning. Uh, I don't have a ton of different um, answers, particularly from Marquette. Loyola and Marquette, both being Catholic Jesuit universities, um, have a very similar audience, at least at the undergraduate level. Uh, so I'll take a second and speak to um, admissions at the Graduate School of Business. I represent the Quinlan School of Business from Loyola University. And uh, many students who are applying to the Graduate School of Business are from uh, not only undergraduate majors in business, but from um, any of the uh, arts and sciences or engineering background. Um, MBA programs were, were originally designed to help professionals such as engineers, doctors, dentists learn the business that they wanted to open if they were going to be entrepreneurial and open their own business. And so they were, uh, MBA programs were not originally designed to just be a Bachelor of Business Administration and then a Master's of Business Administration. Um, it's become that more and more in the last decade. However, um, Master's of Business Administration programs and specialty Master's programs, um, Master's of Science and Accountancy, Master's of Science and Finance, things like that, and anybody can apply to it uh, that have good graduate management admission scores, good graduate record exams, that's the GRE, um, and good grades from their, their undergraduate programs. And so we certainly are seeing uh, continued high applications in master's level programs at Loyola, and that's across the spectrum. Uh, but in particular at the Quinlan School, uh, particularly in this economy, I think students sometimes feel like, well, I need to have a master's degree in order to be a leg up in the marketplace when they're finished. Thank you. And, and you can, any of you can order um, answer this in any order. What value does your university place on accepting well-rounded students as opposed to accepting students based completely on their high school grades, SAT or ACT scores? A few of you mentioned the word well-rounded, but I appreciate some more information about that. I personally, uh, um, I've talked to our, our folks in the admissions office. Students with good uh, high school GPAs and good ACCs or SATs are, are going to be admitted into Loyola University of Chicago. The issue of well-roundedness comes into play, particularly when you talk about scholarship or grant money from the university level. So a student who is involved in activities, and, and, and that, that has a wide range of, of, of look to it. That can be community-based, it can be in a faith-based institution, it can be at the, at the high school. Whatever their well-rounded activities means to that individual student, those are the students that are gonna see 
more likely to see scholarship money and grant money from the university. The acceptance rate, um, particularly at Loyola, has increased uh, over the, or I should say the ACT um, has increased in terms of the number over the last few years. And, and so schools are still using those standardized exams, at least my university is still using the standardized exam. Um, and, and, and the high school GPA as the, as the benchmarks for getting in. Um, so whether students involved or not, I think dictates at least again at Loyola University of Chicago, whether or not scholarship money becomes available. On the state level, in regards to Northern Illinois University, our um, admission requirement for an ACT is a 19, and the GPA is 2.75. Now, you do have students who may have a 20 on the ACT, but only have a 2.5 GPA. That student is given an opportunity to write a letter to say, I know that my GPA does not meet the requirement. However, this is who I am. And we take a look at that. We're finding that, especially in some of the, the bigger cities, the ACT scores are not as good as they were 10 years ago. Um, something is happening with the school system. Not in, your report card is really, really nice, but there are many communities where the report card does not look like this. And so at the state school, <clears throat> we do give students an opportunity to prove themselves on a different level before just taking that flat out 19275. There are a number of factors that we do consider um, for admission. Thank you. In terms of the small university, the small private institution um, that Aurora is, we actually do look at your GPA and the ACT. Um, that is really the determining factor for the scholarships, um, for awarding the scholarships here at AU. Um, also, in terms of just the students that do well at Aurora University, those are the students that are involved in numerous clubs, activities, both in school and outside of school. Um, that shows us that one, time management is key. Uh, that really is one of the things that we do look for with our students. Uh, not just have they gotten you know, that high um, ACT or SAT score, but also you know, they do know how to manage their time and they're able to enjoy everything that they do. Um, I'm not looking for a student that is involved in everything under the sun. Um, by no means am I looking for that. But I'm looking for a student that is out to not only you know, really look to better themselves, but also want to get involved in different things. Look uh, you know, for a student that is undecided that may be the determining factor of what they decide to major in, um, and they may some, uh, surprise themselves. At Harper, when we talk about a well-rounded student, we're not just talking about that student that scored a 36 ACT, and we do have a large percentage of those students that are in that highest score range. We also have those students that may have scored, honestly, a 15 on the ACT or even a 20. But keep in mind of the learning environment that they're part of, these are the same students that are in the same classrooms with adult students with advanced degrees as well too. So they're getting a vast variety of learning from all types of students and they're still very successful as they transfer out to pursue other things. These students are part of Phi Theta Kappa and the Honor Society. And so when we're looking at those students, again, because we are a community college, all the students are gonna be in the same classroom together, getting the same type of learning, and still being able to matriculate and do the things that they still wanna do. So whether the student is very successful academically, socially, in the high schools, they're still going to be successful once they transfer from Harper. Just on a more general level, not specific to Marquette necessarily, if a school is asking for an ACT or an SAT score, there's a reason that they want to see that information. It's an indicator on some level, in addition to obviously the day in, day out work of, of grades and overall GPA and classes that the students have taken. It's still an indicator for many institutions across the country of whether or not that student would be successful when they get to college. Because as a lot of you know, when you get to college, or when you get to a university, you're taking one or two exams and writing one or two papers over the course of a semester. Now there might be more work than that, but for a lot of us that still is an indicator for us of whether or not a student could be successful. The other thing to consider is there's definitely been an influx of institutions across the country that have decided to go test optional, um, that no longer require an ACT or an SAT score, DePaul being one of them. Um, 
where they'll look at other parts to the application and maybe require an interview or something like that. So be mindful, you know, when you start to think about your student taking the ACT or the SAT, there's obviously a reason for it. It is a content-based test. So having them take it in junior year is important because that's usually at the point that they'll know a lot of what's going to be included on the exam. But I think there are going to be other options if a student wants to go to a four-year institution but maybe didn't do as well as they had hoped on the ACT or SAT exam. Thank you. Our district um, places an emphasis not only on academics, but they also we also place an emphasis on what today are being called those soft skills or habits of mind. Um, we want our students to leave as risk takers, self-directed learners, critical thinkers, problem solvers, etc. What influence do you think these skills have? not only in the applicant process, but as you track students through their freshman, through senior year, are there any indications that these skills have values throughout students' education? I think at least at Marquette and probably a lot of other private institutions in the country that when you look at these types of skills, they're not necessarily specific to one major or another. There's a statistic out there now, I think people a little bit younger than me, but students who have graduated from college are gonna change careers, not jobs, but careers, about six or seven times in their lifetime. So people like my dad, who have worked at the same place for 37 years, they don't really exist as, as much anymore. And so these kinds of skills are what I think we place emphasis on when a student gets to Marquette, understanding that wanting them to be able to take some of these classes, being able to do the public speaking thing, to work in a group, to be able to think critically and creatively about the world around them, those are important factors for us at the time that they're spending with us at Marquette in the four or five years, depending on the program that they're in. But I think looking at that at a, at a high school level is a little bit trickier. It's not as necessarily easy for us to see that um, within the application. Obviously, a student who's maybe challenged themselves and taken honors or AP courses, that's going to be um, good for us to see because that shows us, okay, they are ready for collegiate level work. One big thing, though, I think that, that we want to focus on with students kind of coming up the ranks that are maybe in middle school looking to get into high school and then obviously beyond is that they are, as you mentioned earlier, self-starters, that they can take care of themselves, that they can advocate for themselves. That's a big part of us understanding that they're mature and ready to come to college where they don't have the, um, they're not living with their parents, they're not able to fall back onto their parents if something happens. They have to go to their professors if something were to happen. So wanting to work with them now in high school of, of being able for them to understand these things are important, that's really kind of what we're trying to do. Thank you. One of the courses that I teach at NIU is called um, Educational Cultural Competency. One of the things that's happening in our nation is that the diversity is a big buzzword right now. There's all kinds of diversity that's facing us um, in our world. And in order for our students to be prepared and have those, they need to have those critical thinking skills, those soft skills to understand that if, and this is my example, if I cook collard greens one way in my home, is it okay for you to come into my home and tell me, Lemetri, you're cooking that the wrong way? No, you're not going to be able to do that. But what I can say is, oh, you have a different way of preparing them. But if we don't teach our children at the elementary, middle school, high school level, that it's okay to not be exactly to the same, to have an opportunity to develop the skills that you just described, will make them more comfortable and in, in a college setting they can work on those things. And some of those things, especially diversity, is very uncomfortable to talk about. And so wouldn't it be a phenomenal thing to be able to do that with your parents? 
with your loved ones, with your teachers, with people that you've grown up with. And so by the time they're at the university level, it just kind of comes as a natural trait that they already have. So I think that that's really important. Thank you. Um, the one thing that I can say that is really important, not just as a student that is applying to or any of these institutions, I think these are all great traits that will make them really truly successful at any one of the universities you know, sitting up here today. But I think really, it really kind of prepares them um, in order to be successful at the, at the college. Um, these are things that are really, I find that I have, a, I work with the out-of-state population. Um, I find that a lot of my students are um, the risk takers. You know, I, I can't tell you how many numerous students I have coming from California this year. That's a risk. Um, coming to an area they've never even visited, you know, maybe once. But these are students that really truly have gone out uh, and said, you know, this is what I'm going to do, and they've made that decision without their parents. I think being able to make um, the effort not just to, now I'm not saying go across country, but what I am saying is that it speaks volumes to not just the admissions counselors, but to the faculty members that the students are coming to them, they know when to come for them, and they know when to seek help. Um, we, you know, like I said, we, we do push our students to really understand that if you're suffering in a class, it's okay. Go seek help. Go talk to your professors. Go, you know, seek out tutoring. Do those things that are going to make you successful, and that doesn't make you a weak person. So I think really what these uh, traits are doing is really preparing them to be successful, not at the college level, but also, you know, within their career and as a human being. I think specifically um, with the type of students that we're looking for, those students that have an opportunity to be accepted anywhere, and as they are looking financially at their college options, they're able to have a conversation with their parents, look at all those options and say, you know what, financially, what would be the best decision for me, for the family, long term, if I'm going to go on to get a graduate degree or a postgraduate degree. And so in thinking in terms of our application process, those type of students that are able to really sit down and weigh out those options, use those analytical skills to plan out the next five to 10 years of a life, it's important that they're able to do that. And we do get a lot of those students. As the admission staff, we work with those students. I've worked at several institutions, and so for me, it's about finding the right fit for the student. Harper is not the right fit for every student, but as we sit down and talk about what their long-term goals are, in addition to just what your academic stance is, what is your long-term goal? And being able to make sure that we help them, even if it is assisting them down the road to Marquette, that's helping them enhance those soft skills, those analytical skills, those risk-taking skills. Uh, most of these colleges and universities have first year experience courses. Those courses are critical to those students being prepared as they're to deciding on their future, whether they're going to go to graduate school, go work for the workforce, or just simply just take some time off and do some world traveling. So it's very important to all of our processes, but being able to find out what's best for the student and making sure that they have the right plan of action is just critical to helping them enhance those skills. Thank you. In the packet that uh, Dr. Truding uh, made available to all of you, there's an article by Vishal Jane, and, and he listed um, seven different soft skills that I think really uh, speak to the issues more than, more than maybe a couple of the other articles. And, and these are skills that the university is continuing to try to teach the students because developmentally they are going to change from 9 to 12 and then again from freshman to senior year in college and, it, and it's the developmental progression that we all want to see for a, success, a successful outcome post-graduation and whether that's going into the workforce, um, going into some sort of volunteer activity or going into graduate school and we're emphasizing in, in the classroom these same sort of soft skills with a real emphasis on trying to be uh, workforce ready and, and the professionalism and the maturity and the risk taking and the advocacy for themselves are all are all issues that they're going to be in a different place after 12th grade than than when they started high school and then when they finished college and so I we do think that these are really important skills for life and that we have to continue to emphasize in their educational experience at the college level Thank you. So interesting. So many things for us to think about. 
I'm going to turn the program over to Dr. Jerome, who's going to ask a similar set of questions to our parent panel. Thank you. Uh, and thank you very much, college representatives. Uh, you are certainly a very important partner in this process. We see the schools as a partner, and we certainly see the parents as partners. So we're turning to the parent partners now to ask a few questions of their experience. And let's see what our first question is for them. You have all taken at least one of your children through the college admissions process. What did you learn about the qualities admissions offices are looking for in their incoming students? Did any of these qualities surprise you? Mike Brown, let's start with you. I think one of the strongest components of what surprised me really stood out, and that was the interest in the colleges about the students' adaptive thinking. They wanted to know if they could take the formal education and transfer that into the needed skills to get through everyday processes, such as sign up for a class, call a professor when things weren't going as well in the class as they needed, uh, writing a very simple and succinct message about uh, an analysis of a class, and these type of capabilities. A lot of the students that applied to these schools thought they knew a lot of these uh, different um, abilities, and then when they got there, and I have one son in college, as Dr. Trump has mentioned, um, and some of these very adult requirements were needed. Um, the challenge was there, and all of a sudden the phone calls were coming home, and uh, I said, well, you know, you're really calling the wrong person at this time. You need to call that professor, or call that administrator, or call that advisor, and they need to walk you through some of these things. So it was those life skills that all of a sudden became much more important for them to work through, even though the formal education was there, he had to transfer that with uh, much better adaptive reasoning and uh, communication skills. Written communication was the skill that my son was complimented on by the admissions department and the particular school of design that he was applying to. And it, it seemed so basic to me. I was, I actually was kind of taken aback that my son was getting a pat on the back that he was able to articulate well and eloquently back and forth with another adult. And I came to one of our school board meetings and I told the rest of my peers on the school board, I said, this is a revelation to me because in our day, we were taught how to write thank you notes. We were taught how to solicit to an admissions officer, hello, my name is Diana Chrysis. I am interested in Loyola University. We don't necessarily teach that particular skill anymore. I mean, how many of you in the audience remember having to write thank you notes in second grade? I mean, it was one of our grammar lessons. Our kids are texting, and they skip that whole step of social interaction of the narrative form. And that was the one aha moment that I had during the um, admissions process with my child that he was being complimented on something that in my mind had been instilled in him since he was in first grade. And how important that writing is. Um, you're all entering just a wonderful and mysterious process. <laughs> and that's what we're all trying to learn about. We can uh, talk about acronym alert here, ACT, SAT, GPA, class rank, things like that. That's probably where you've been thinking a lot about lately. And those are certainly important. And when you look at, there are a lot of websites where you can find out well, what is a particular, what is Aurora or a Loyola looking for in terms of ACT, SAT? And there's probably a big range, there's probably an average, but it can give you some feeling of what might be appropriate. But let's get beyond that, because um, particularly if you're talking about a competitive admission process, they want to know about leadership qualities, and they want to know about how successful the stu your student is going to be when they go to the college. And I kept hearing over and over again that 
we want to select the students coming in that we know can be successful because once we get them in, we're going to make sure that they are successful and they're going to do whatever they can to, to do that. Part, and part of what they're looking at is things like the course levels. Um, AP exams, honors courses, levels of math and science, world language, there are all requirements. Again, those are kind of some of the easy things to evaluate. The other things, the habits of mind kind of questions are much more um, harder to figure out. But school activities is very much a measure of leadership. So you can figure, have your kids go to 14 different activities and they'll be fine. No, that's not what they're looking for. It's more like, is there a particular activity that they can really pour their heart and soul into and then maybe take on a leadership role? For my daughter, it was marching band. I mean, she just lived and breathed marching band. She moved up, became a section leader. Um, and took on several instruments. That's something that, that made a, a, a big difference. I mean, she was involved in a number of other things also, but that was a huge area that she, that, um, um, that she got involved in. And that's something that's big for, for colleges, as I understand it, that a leadership role is taken on. The other thing, kind of tying in with what Diana said is, there are essays. My daughter finished a couple of them at 11.59 from the deadline that they were due, but um, those, those essays are important in, in showing um, how well can, you, can the student communicate. So those, those are a few of the things that, from a parent point of view, what were communicated to, to us. Hi, I guess I have a, um, a different uh, I guess perspective or different experiences. I feel like I'm learning so much here today. Um, my daughter is a junior and she's an athlete. So I guess my experiences are a little bit different. Um, we didn't per se go through the application and all the essay part, but instead we had the opportunity to go out to about 10 and 12 universities. And it was a little different in respect that we went immediately to the admissions folks and sat down and talked to them. So it was quite enlightening having your 16-year-old daughter actually having a formal interview with admissions, um, you know, an admissions, admissions staff. And I found it quite fascinating that, I guess again from a different perspective, that not only are they looking for the athlete, but they are looking at absolutely the ACT, the GPA. They're looking at the transcript, making sure that um, your child has been taking you know, AP classes, honors classes. And I thought the other questions that were quite interesting were, how involved are they? How much have they given back to the community? And you know, I guess I thought, well, geez, you know, she's you know, got the ball handling down, she's got the shooting down, she's got the GPA, isn't that enough? But they were certainly asking a lot of those questions. So, um, you know, from, from my perspective is, you know, it, it's so important to not only have a child that is involved um, in activities, whether it be sports, marching band, student council, dance, orchestras, whatever it may be, but um, also giving back a little bit to the community, whether it is through um, the high school, whether it is through, you know, the, the community here, there's quite a few, or through the church, I think that's, that makes a well-rounded person, which they were looking for. So let me just um, go back through. We'll start with you, Denise. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to combine two questions. We're going to um, uh, fit this into our hour of sharing. And so uh, we'll have two uh, answers from you to the audience. One is, what piece of advice would you give the audience about this process? And the other is, would you just address what things, experiences you wished your child would have had in school, either in Arlington Heights or in the high school program, before she goes off to college? Um, you know, I, I think it, I was so impressed with, already at the elementary school, how many 
activities and opportunities they gave to these kids. Um, you know, my you know my oldest right away got involved with um, you know student council with those after school activities, and I think it provided her a great deal of um, leadership already at such a young age. Um, what in I, I guess so some advice is even if you're coming in with a kindergartner, um, I think you know take take advantage of these opportunities that are provided through the PTAs and through the community and through the schools. Um, there are so many, there are so many activities that I think help shape who she is, and um, the other question that was, so those are things I think you should do. You asked, what was your first question, sir? What, ex what experiences you wished your child would have had before she goes off to college, and then the advice piece. Okay. Um, the advice piece I think I've handled. Um, some of the things I wish she would have done a little bit more of is if there were more ways to involve herself within the community. Because I think, you know, there's so many things that you can do, um, you know, in the schools and such, but I think to spread out a little bit and do things more within the community. Um, she took advantage of some of the programs here in the village um, from, you know, the teen council and such, but it would have, I think there could have been more opportunities to give back to this community. Bill? In, in terms of advice, um, and you mentioned PTA, by the way, I just want to throw in a plug that the PTA does have a scholarship for uh, District 25 students when they're graduating from high school. So keep that in mind. Don't forget about that. But um, think careers. Think careers earlier, the better. And that's going to work for some students. For others, they're not going to have the slightest idea, maybe even when they're in the middle of college. But the earlier that you can expose them to some things with careers, uh, because you have to think past college in terms of, of where they're going to be going and in terms of figuring out uh, a major. And that can also um, relate to activities that they may be involved with in high school. Uh, for example, in medical area, there are courses that District 214 has, a very select course dealing with medical. Um, there, in engineering, there's robotics, um, which is based at Rolling Meadows, but is available to um, students at all of the um, uh, high schools. You know, teaching, cooking, child care, all these different things. There are a lot of opportunities to help them prepare. And um, if there are special needs, there are accommodations that colleges have. Uh, special education does not stop with high school. Um, and District 214 does have some seminars that are dealing with that. And if there's a need there, I would encourage you to ask about that and go to some of those seminars. Um, you know, it's and also in the school, in picking out a school, it's OK to pick a school for reasons other than strictly the academics. You know, we talk about a well-rounded student. Well, we also want a school that fits in with whatever that student is most interested in. And, you know, sometimes the tendency is, well, what's the best academic school that the student can go to? Boy, there are tons of choices. And look at some of the other things besides just the, the majors and the academics. I'm going to piggyback on what Phil said. <clears throat> My biggest piece of advice is that there are multiple schools for each of your children, multiple right fits, and there are multiple <clears throat> kids who are the right fits for all of these schools here, and you have to keep that in your mind. I went to Bigfoot High School in Walworth, Wisconsin, pardon my voice. I went to Rollins College in Winter Park, Florida. Rollins College is smaller than South and Thomas Middle Schools. I think it's smaller than Ivy Hill grade school. <laughs> no one's ever heard of any of these places. And I'm perfectly happy with where I ended up in my life. And that was so refreshing because 
raising kids in the privileged Northwest suburbs of Chicago has you surrounded by very, very talented families and kids. And you have to keep your head focused on the fact that there is a place for my child. There are multiple places for my child. My child might start a community college and end up at a four-year institution, or my child might go to a couple community institutions before they find their place. And just one quick aside, Sarah, I was checking my email right before the panel started, and I have to share this because it's, it's so indicative of what we're talking about. One of our friend's kids started out at Columbia College wasn't the right fit for him. He's now taking um, classes at Oakton Community College. He also went to a um, fine arts college up in northern Michigan. Still not the right fit. This child is in his 20s and is now working part-time at Lutheran General Hospital. And his dad just sent out an email that said, our kid just was published in a child's, he did all the illustrations in a child's book like a learning how to read book. And so my point is, he bounced around, but he's finding his path. So there's a place for everybody. And in speaking to the outliers that might be watching this, communication is key. So when you ask about what is it that I wish my son would have um, endeavored, I, I actually don't have any regrets. I'm just very thankful that he's able to communicate during the whole admissions process and had that foundation from our district teaching and from the District 214 schools because as they've all been indicating here, once they leave our nest, it's between our kids and those institutions of higher learning and the only way that that fit is going to really work is if both sides are communicating well with one another. Thank you. Mike. Um, one of the large pieces I saw out there also, which somewhat parallels Mr. Crucius' thought on careers, is to figure out majors. And the step going into a career comes from that major. Uh, District 214 does have some fantastic classes about all the different uh, majors that are in colleges. And they start going through health, and they start going through business, and communications, and uh, the management classes, uh, the arts, and so on and so forth. But as juniors and 16-year-olds, of course, are not quite focused on their careers, but this decision leads to that career decision. Uh, so one of the conversations we really were lacking at home was talking about the nuances or what were the day-to-day -day activities that a, a, an accountant did, or a teacher did, or a, a veterinarian did, or anybody else that was out there. Because of course, as adults, we all know many, many different adults that are in different careers and study different things to get to those careers. So we put two and two together after having our second kid. We, of course, messed up the first one completely. We had it right the second time. And we had those conversations at the dinner table, and all of a sudden it really got her wheels turning, and she was starting to ask questions back. And that's when we knew that there was finally some interest in her discovering what her passions were to do with her life. And so we're glad that the uh, light bulb went on for us in that respect. And it was only five and seven minute conversations, but the next time she showed up in one of those classes, Next thing we heard about was uh, some health class we went to, or she went to a pharmacy uh, class, and they said, did you know the starting pharmacist makes $128,000 when they graduate from undergraduate school? I said, no, I didn't know that. But now for the first time, she had finally really taken in one of those classes, uh, so there was going to be a great benefit to her. Uh, the second piece of Dr. Jerome's question was, what do we wish we had seen that was better um, through these few years of making some big decisions about uh, higher education. And probably the biggest thing that we saw that uh, could have been out there that um, was so poignant was the communication skills and the ways to improve those communication skills at the high school level. Uh, there's some capability to do it even at the elementary level. It's a real honor when I see one of the children come to one of our board meetings and put on a presentation about technology or what he did with an iPad, or how he builds an app. And we've had third graders, fifth graders, and seventh graders do that. And that is such a fantastic skill to be able to communicate with adults, not only one-on-one, -on -one, but one-on-40. 
And that's certainly a wonderful gift that that child is already accelerating. Well, in the high school level, they have something called DECA, which is Decentralized Education Curriculum um, Association. And that project is something that gives the students a chance to go in front of many different types of businesses and have to give a small speech, which they're given a half an hour to prepare on, about how they would handle this situation. Well, one of our children got involved in DECA, and one did not. The one that got involved had great communication skills, was very comfortable speaking with an adult, finally at 17. Before that, he really didn't have that interest, he wasn't comfortable, he was shy, he was in a shell, and um, those aren't things that you and I both know are going to uh, accelerate their capabilities in life, because we have to not only know our information well and be able to think about it, but then be able to quite often communicate it in a team setting. Well, that's what the DECA was all about. If DECA isn't done, there's other classes such as speech, there's debate, there are service over self, there are other organizations that force them to take leadership and communication skills to a much higher level. And then when they get into their formal education, they can transfer that so much more to a group at a strong level by going through some of these other um, opportunities that are available out there um, at a formal level and in District 214. Thank you. Wow. I just feel so privileged to be in the room with such wise people. So let's take just a minute to thank the nine panelists who are up here. Bravo. We have one more who will be presenting on screen from Northwestern, Dr. Bruce Linval, who is the, let's just read this correctly here, Assistant Dean for Graduate Studies at Northwestern University. And we'll take a minute to listen to what he has to say. One, I am Bruce Linval, I'm Assistant Dean for Graduate Studies in the McCormick School of Engineering and Applied Science at Northwestern University. I'm sorry I can't be with you this evening, but I'm attending a national meeting in Boston, Massachusetts. I wanted to tell you that I have uh, a background in college admission work that spans four decades. I've worked in undergraduate admissions at the University of Kansas and Purdue University. I've worked in graduate admissions at both the University of Kansas and here at Northwestern. Currently, I oversee the graduate admissions process to all of the engineering programs at Northwestern. I've been asked a few questions. I would like to address those questions, and then what I'll do is add a few things that I think are important for you to know. One of the first questions I was asked is whether things have changed in the last five or 10 years. I would say the answer to that is yes and no. We certainly have things that are relatively the same at public universities. Public universities tend to use numbers. In other words, they look at class rank, they look at test scores, they look at GPAs, they also will take a look at the courses that a student has taken. Rarely will you find a public university asking essay questions. On the other hand, a more select institution, a private institution, like Northwestern will ask students to respond to one or more essay questions and typically those essay questions are ways that schools are looking for what a student has done besides academics. Are they involved in activities? Uh, are they problem solvers? You know, are they doing the types of things that someone looks for when you have a very strong applicant pool and you're looking for students who really are very well-rounded individuals. So I think for a long time, the public universities, because of sheer volume of the number of people who apply, the number of people who are admitted, they look at numbers and they cut things off with grade point averages, test scores, but when you're a private school and you're dealing with significant applications, then they have people who read the essay responses of students, and make decisions based upon many, many factors. There's no question that the McCormick School of Engineering is looking for very well-rounded individuals. We want people with, first of all, outstanding records, but we also want people who are active, involved, 
and uh, really well-rounded applicants. There are some other questions here I would like to address, and then I want to share some things to get you thinking beyond the long term. Uh, I have been in higher ed, as I've said, for four decades. I have seen summer activities move from a lot of sports camps to lots of academic programs that are available. I plan to send information that can be handed out so you can contact me, but I also want you to be aware of the Center for Talent Development at Northwestern University. There are many summer enrichment programs. So if you have an elementary student, a middle school student, or even someone in high school, there are many activities that go beyond the baseball camp, the football camp. There are academic programs available in the summer. I would strongly encourage you to look for those opportunities. I want to jump ahead a little bit and say that most of the emphasis that families and high school counselors have will be on getting the student admitted from high school into an undergraduate program. I have done that. I've also helped students apply for admission to the veterinary school at Purdue. I'm involved in master's and PhD admission. So I think in today's world, it's important for students not to prepare for just undergraduate education. I also encourage students to consider that they're going to need a master's or some who are exceptionally bright need to be looking at a PhD. Two things I want to tell you about PhD admission, and I hope they're both surprising, and I hope you learn from it. First of all, PhDs are free. Yes, they do not cost a student in most cases. In the Northwestern McCormick School of Engineering and Applied Science, we pay the tuition for a PhD student. We provide the student with a monthly stipend of at least $1,800 all the way up to close to $2,500 a month. And at Northwestern, we also pay for health insurance. That's important to know. You can apply for undergraduate financial aid, but when you get to the PhD program, it is free and it's not based upon need. The other thing that truly, truly concerns me that I'm very passionate about, 70% of our PhD applicants every year are international students. I am concerned that we don't have more U.S. students thinking about graduate school and moving on. I wonder how is it that parents and students from all over the world know they can come to the United States and have a free education in a PhD program and then we have such a small number of students in the United States apply for PhD admission. As I said earlier, I will have a handout available to you tonight. You can always follow up with me individually. Uh, I will also give you the website for the Center for Talent Development so you can look at summer enrichment programs. And I would also add this special note. Many years ago, I was director of undergraduate admissions at the University of Kansas. I would personally come to the Chicago area two weeks every year. And of the four high schools that are in your district, I have personally visited each of your high schools on an annual basis, probably for four or five years. So I know your school districts well. You have outstanding students. We encourage all of you um, to work with your young people, encourage them to take strong academic programs and to especially seek graduate opportunities. Hey, thanks very much, and I look forward to hearing from you if you want to send me an email. Thank you. And thank you, Bruce. So uh, at, in the next 15 minutes, we would like to open it up to questions. If you have some of the panelists, I will be happy to give you the uh, microphone so you can identify yourself and the question. Okay. Hi, I'm Carrie Boyle. I'm the uh, oldest as a seventh grader at South Middle School. So, um, I had a question about uh, I think it was Tamara who was talking, or Tamara was it? Tamara? Tamara. Um, you were talking about applicants and at community college level, mm -hmm. and that also once you start at community college, you have many opportunities to then move on. And but we didn't really talk about how 
applications from students from community colleges are viewed and processed and judged. Um, is there a difference? You know, it's, I would imagine, less weighted on numbers once you're coming from another college or transferring. How, how does that play out? I mean, from you, but then also from four years. Okay. So with the community colleges, it's pretty much just open admission. And so a ACT score is not necessarily required. I say not necessarily because there's an opportunity for students to take a placement exam. So if you decide that you don't take the ACT, and I think nowadays everybody's required to take the ACT test, um, that placement exam will place you in college level courses or developmental courses. So if we just kind of move over the ACT to the side, all of our incoming students must take a placement exam if they're going to be considered full time. And then again, from there they are placed on. And then in terms of transferring, if you are a full-time student and you decide that you want to stick with your academic advisor, um, they will work very hard with you to make sure that you follow the Illinois Articulation Initiative Agreement that the Illinois Community College System has with the four-year colleges and university in the state of Illinois and beyond that if you follow this particular curriculum guideline, you will have a successful transfer. Every school is different, so the requirements to transfer to Marquette may be different from Aurora University. It just really depends. But as long as they follow the general education guide, and the general education courses are pretty much university no matter where you transfer, it just depends on how well you follow those to a T. Uh, I also used to be an advisor and I worked with non-traditional students. So actually I wasn't thinking so much about that path that you kind of decided from the beginning. I was thinking more for students who have financial concerns and they don't want to be doing 120 hours at a four-year university and they want to diversify. And the concern that I'm hearing from other people and that I also have, you know, down the road for myself is that I have a student, a high achieving student who is a junior senior in high school going, taking some courses maybe a year to two year you know, or college, and then is that application going to be considered at a prestigious university in the same way as they would have maybe if they had, if, if the reliance is less on test scores, is less on numbers that maybe they had as a junior or senior, is, is this making sense? Like, is that going to hurt them student. as far as a transfer student? Yes. Okay. Um, well, let me just give you a scenario, and, and, and they aren't look the same, and I, honestly, I say that. But here's a scenario. So now, Harper has an agreement with University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana, with the engineering program. So you go two years at Harper and then transfer to U of I. We're getting a lot of students with 30 ACTs that have been denied at U of I that are now coming to Harper to get into our engineering program to then go transfer into the U of I program. So again, these students, now we were on, and I'm on that advisory board, so this is, I'm telling you factual information. These are students that, Harper was probably the third or fourth. They had maybe U of I and a couple of other engineering schools at their top choice. But U of I was their first choice and they were denied. They're coming to Harper because we have the engineering agreement, two years, and then they've gotten admitted into the engineering, the back doorway. So you can kind of look at it in two different ways. That's just one particular instance where, you know, where you may not traditionally have gotten into a top tier institution, the front way coming in, traditionally out of high school, but you're still going to U of I and you're still getting that degree from U of I. So, so to me personally, I think it just varies on how you look at it. We have a very good transfer agreement with all these schools up here. And so you hear about the horror stories when students don't follow that curriculum guidelines. We have transfer scholarships. So if you decide that you want to go to a Northwestern, okay, you're saving probably about $60,000 coming to Harper, but students are still transferring to Northwestern and then still continuing on their studies. So I think really it's a how you look at it and the opportunities that you're gonna go into. If your son is a high achiever and they decide that they wanna um, apply to another school and they don't get in, you still have an opportunity to get that same curriculum and then still transfer out the back doorway. So that's my perspective of looking at it. I wonder if any other panelists would like to weigh in. I, I think that um, particularly since 2008, I think most of the four-year institutions, uh, of course, what will include it, have seen an uptick in transfer applications. So there are many, many students 
attending community colleges for one or two years. If they go the full two years, as Tamara said, and get the associate's degree, there are a number of universities, Loyola is soon to be included with the fall 2013 class in the IAI agreement where, we, where if the student performs well at the school, they should finish in four more semesters. And so they're still on an eight semester plan um, for the most part. I, you know, we can't write it in stone and we can't guarantee it because we don't know how well they're gonna perform. But a high achieving student who does do four semesters at a community college ought to be able to finish most four-year schools in the next two years. Um, I think each four-year school will have a certain percentage of slots available for a transfer student, and I think you have to look at that at our individual websites to find out sort of how many transfer students we're going to take. Well, it's going to take over 1,000 transfer students next year um, for the fall class. And then there's another group, a small group that comes in January. Um, but. Um, I think it's doable at, at, at selective schools, big time universities. I think that many universities do have a certain percentage of, of transfer students, and I would think even Northwestern University is going is going to take some transfer students. The application process, though, is different. It is. The application process, the deadlines, the scholarship opportunities, generally speaking, the timeline. Will those students that want to transfer from Harper to Marquette have to follow a different timeline than a freshman applicant from Rolling Meadows or First Year Prospect? Yes. To put it plainly. <laughs> and no, although, no, no, although that you can, let, let me just piggyback one more time on what Tamara said. If you, your student did, I think everybody does take the ACT in Illinois, but let's just say for some reason they didn't, although I don't think that's a choice anymore. You do not have to have that test score, at least at Loyola anymore. We are strictly going to be looking at the transcript from the community college if you're a full year, at least a full one year. If you're only a semester, we're still going to look at high school. But um, a, a 30 credit hour student or a 60 credit hour student does not have to have a standardized test score. But again, I do think that's a moot point here in Illinois. Thank you. Any other questions? Actually, I did want to add to that last part, and not as a counselor, but as somebody who was a transfer student. Um, I did full two years at Harper, um, and I actually, the biggest thing that I, one, can attest to Harper, is that their advisors, their academic advisor, their uh, Dubois McCarthy, mm -hmm. I don't even know if he's still there, he's yes. wonderful. Um, I worked, I, I made my decision very early on um, within that first semester at Harper, and, and for me, the reason why I attended, I'm a first generation college student, um, first in my family um, to even, you know, achieve my master's. But for me, it was more, you know what, I wanted to save myself some money and I really was not completely decided on. I hadn't found my perfect fit of a college for me. And I decided to do those first two years at Harper and I ended up finishing out with full 60 uh, credits. So I transferred in as a junior to uh, North Central um, in Naperville. And, I, the biggest thing, if I can give you any sort of advice, if you, if you do have a student that is considering doing those, even just a year or, or a semester, um, you know, at the community college, is begin that communication, not just with your counselor at the community college, but also begin talking with the, and, and having a conversation with the transfer counselors at the school that the students are considering. Um, because, you know, for me on both ends, I was able to coordinate it that I was able to complete all of my general education requirements within those two years for North Central. So by the time I got there, I was able to, to, to get in there without a problem and begin my master's courses. And I graduated in, in two, you know, in the, uh, they were on a trimester schedule, but I was able to graduate when I, when I should have. So I graduated in four years. So it is possible, but if I can't give you any sort of advice, is get involved with the counselors at, at the community college, be it Oakton or Harper, but get in contact uh, with the transfer staff at the, the colleges that the students are considering. Thank you, my name is Brian Weinberg. The question I have is, you've used the term well-rounded. My, my freshman in high school daughter is on the math team and the science Olympiad team has no interest in, in athletics. Does that still count as well-rounded? Absolutely. Mm, just want to make sure that she has zero interest in athletics. Well, I have, I have a little bit of a negative story in that situation where one of the top Hersey students applied to a very prestigious Southeast University two years ago, and he had a 35 in the ACT and a 5.2 grade point average. Never had anything but an A, actually had one A minus in all of high school. He was rejected from that university because he was captain of the debate team, he was an SOS, and did not go out for any athletics. 
he was duly surprised. And they think he could have gotten into Harvard. He didn't bother, he's going to Northwestern now. But we were really surprised because their point from this university was that there are some no-cut athletic teams, such as track and so on and so forth. And that was their point, and he was duly surprised because he's getting a full-ride scholarship at Northwestern. So. He's at the better fit. Yeah. That's what I would say, so, he's at the better fit. Just want to keep that in perspective. And just to kind of add to that, there are no guarantees. A, a perfect score and a perfect GPA, there is still not a guarantee at all. So that's the other thing, it's nothing's guaranteed. <clears throat> My name is Lisa Johnson, and back in the day, you always took the ACT and the SAT. Now all I hear up there is ACT. Is there any need for an SAT? Some schools, um, some schools might actually say they, they only consider the SAT. That's why um, it's so important to, obviously, you're maybe not at the point of, of starting the college search process, but when you do get to that point, it doesn't matter what school you're considering. If it's in Florida, if it's in New York, California, if you want to go to school in Canada. There's somebody that works with students in Chicago, Illinois, the Midwest. Find that person. We each have territories that we um, work with in terms of a population of students and I think that's a great question to ask those schools because a lot of the answers that you'll hear from us when people ask us questions like this, well, it depends because it really depends on the institution and what they're looking for. A lot of this is on the website, yes. so it's information that's very easy to find, but I think it's also important for you to realize that finding your person that works with Hersey or Rolling Meadows or the Chicagoland area or Illinois or the Midwest is going to help you as you go forward completely understand the process, ask any questions, and get any concerns addressed. I would definitely take both sets of tests yeah. because the ACT measures what you know mm -hmm. and the SAT measures your aptitude for learning. And as they said, different schools are looking for different things. Just from a self-esteem perspective, our child did much better on the SATs and the ACT, and that helped them get through their day when everybody's talking about their 36s. Yeah, no idea. Yeah, and I know I did better on the SAT back in those days. But um, Ivy League and a lot of the California schools, they will require SAT. And there are also some additional tests that some, some of them will require, some subject area tests like in math. Um, you know, it's, it's up to you, but that's sometimes what they require. You gotta jump through hoops, and for some colleges it seems like that's what they are. They're just some hoops to jump through. To add to that real quickly, um, it is a geographic thing. Um, when I worked at Illinois Institute of Technology, a lot of the students that are strong math and science people take the SATs and the SAT subject tests. So if you're applying to an engineering or an architect type school and you know your student is very, very strong in the math and science and not so in the English, see taking that ACT, that English will bring that score down versus taking the SATs where it would definitely uh, make it go a little higher because of that math component. So I would encourage you to know your students and how they test well and then talk to the schools. Usually, as you said, the, the West Coast and the South really are SAT takers. So just something, something to consider. I wanna again thank the panel for the wise advice that they've shared. And I want to uh, invite my wise colleague, Dale Trudy, to have the last word. <laughs> well, you're supposed to say class dismissed, but I just want to stay it all day because I've learned so much from all of you. And I can just say for the audience that you've made us wiser and you've given us much to think about. So thank you very, very much. And thank you to all the participants in the audience.